My name is Kelsey Klotz. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Music at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, my research focuses on Dave Brubeck. I'm currently writing a book through Oxford University Press called Dave Brubeck and the Performance of Whiteness that's using Dave Brubeck as kind of a focal point to understand what whiteness meant at mid-century. So not only what it meant for him as he created his music and operated in his career, but also what it meant for jazz critics who were predominantly white at the time to talk about him and also for his audiences, um, what, what whiteness had, what role it had to play um, in their enjoyment of his music and in their um, kind of entry point, using him as an entry point into the broader world of, of jazz. Excellent, thank you. Um, so the, the one thing that I would like to begin with is, um, and we'll talk first about Dave Rubeck, I think, where he um, had an integrated band and he was doing a college tour which I guess, how common was that for jazz musicians at the time? Um, doing college tours was pretty common um, beginning and around, around the 1950s. And Dave Brubeck really was one of the first to start doing this. Um, his wife, Iola, um, they needed gigs. And so his wife, Iola, wrote to different colleges around California that were within driving distance um, and asked, do you want a jazz group to play? His group at that point was um, mostly and usually white. Sometimes there was a black bassist who would join in here and there, um, but it was usually white. And so in the fifties, that's really how Brubeck builds his brand is as a college touring musician. And he takes some credit for getting other jazz groups and particularly getting black jazz groups like the Modern Jazz Quartet into similar college tours um, as well. Um, within the South though, I think you get, uh, you still have some college tours, but they have some different rules that are, that, that are needed to follow. Yes, and <clears throat> that was, um, I mean, again, we're talking about what, 1957 to 59, that area, mm -hmm. that era? So the colleges, um, and I guess UGA, uh, University of Georgia, changed their policy based on him. East Carolina University, that was East Carolina College then, now it's East Carolina University. Um, yeah, he came with Eugene Wright in um, 1958 to East Carolina College. Um, they didn't know that he had an integrated quartet. He had actually just integrated it. Um, and uh, they told him that he couldn't perform. He said, that's ridiculous. I'm, I'm not going to perform without my black bassist. Um, uh, and it was something that was escalated to the North Carolina governor. And the governor, essentially what the reports are, the North Carolina governor essentially said, well, did you already pay him? And they said, yes, we've already paid him. Um, and, and that uh, kind of got him, the, the, the school officials were kind of like, okay, I guess the governor is not gonna fight this. Um, we'll let you play. And then afterwards they, um, they uh, made it so that integrated ensembles could essentially perform um, at East Carolina College. And this is the, if I'm correct, this is the quote um, that I wanted to kind of pick out, which was accepting the skill of the Negro performer and even going so far as appreciating it as a giant step towards integration. And we cannot afford to be the least bit broad-minded, not even for the sake of art. That was their that was, uh, that was a student at UGA, which happened in 1959, so a year later. Okay. He tried again to take his quartet into the South. He's invited by um, the, the Jazz Society of UGA, um, which was new. It was brand new. <laughs> um, and uh, again, they thought that he was an all-white quartet. Um, and they sent the promotional materials and um, learned that he was not an all white quartet. Um, and that was, it blew up in the editorials and that was in an editorial written by a student um, 
in in such hyperbolic language that it almost seems like a it almost seems like a parody um, of, of themselves. Um, and that one was one where he he did not succeed and he was not allowed to perform. Mm -hmm. I think that tying oh Brubeck wasn't allowed to perform based on the yeah. Right. Yeah. They they just they revoked the invitation. The student who led the jazz society did kind of try to keep it, um, and but there is only so much that this student could do um, in the in the face of the university officials telling him and state officials as well um, saying that integrated quartets could not or integrated groups could not perform they could have all white groups they could have all black groups they could not have integrated ensembles yeah that's incredible and then i think tying that idea especially in the south to um the, the morris article uh, which we'll be discussing uh, why is everyone stealing black music and kind of the the white rage white fear of black performing performers you know in in the minstrel shows having white people perform as black people and then eventually black people having to put on darker makeup to perform um do you how do you see that development as it moves into yeah i think that um in the article, he, he spends so much time with black based minstrelsy, which is so important um, because I, I think there's not enough space given to that as um, really America's first popular musical form um, in, in so many different ways. But I see what I, what I would bring into the conversation is Eric Lott's conversation of love and theft. Um, so Eric Lott writes about black based minstrelsy and he sees this, um, it's fear, but there is some, it, it's fear is kind of hard to, to take out of the love. There is this interest and intrigue in this other, which white people have created as an other. Um, and so they've, there is that, that kind of interest and, and blackface, the, the kind of putting makeup on, creates a distance. And so it creates that ability to make sure that that love doesn't overcome the white actor for the audience's presence so that they can still kind of point and laugh and enjoy it without having to come too close to, you know, love of, of black people without having to come too close to miscegenation and all of these things. I think what we're seeing, particularly as, as we move through the Jim Crow era and as, um, as white people and black people are kind of rubbing up against each other in more ways, we see that distance um, kind of going away. We, and, and that's something that is so uncomfortable for white Americans, white Southerners, yes, but across the country, um, that, that they don't have that way of distancing anymore. And so what Carol Anderson writes when she writes about white rage is about, I, I see kind of a, a connection between that minstrelsy and between this moment in, in the 1950s where you start seeing these images of, of white people protesting integration in various locations um, that we see this just utter fear of those, those separations coming down and it manifests in rage. Uh, at, at this time. And the, um, I mean, it's interesting too, because the, as we were talking before the interview, the, the minstrelsy allowed white people to translate black songs and dialect and, and jokes and culture and all that kind of stuff through a white lens, which I think is what you were talking about with this, like, we love to, to laugh at and see, but at the same time, we don't want to celebrate at this point in, in history. And um, 
Yeah, I think there's a quote in there. Sorry to interrupt. There's a but there's a quote in there that that really um, stays with me. That that Morris writes, um, "Loving black culture has never meant loving black people too." Um, and I think that that is an important point to kind of come back to at, at that as as in what in relation to what you're talking about. But at the same time, we have, you know, as it moves out of white blackface then black culture becomes more authentic than white culture or white translation of black culture. Maybe you can kind of unpack that for us if, if you can. Yeah, well, this, yeah, I, I'll try. It's a, it's a big question. Um, and, it, and it's one that I, I'm not sure has a, has a clear answer. So there are... Um, so I'll, I'll probably just talk in circles around it to try to just give some different kind of entry points into it. Um, in terms of kind of thinking about authenticity and race and music, um, uh, I'm going to pull it into jazz for a minute because that's that's just my wheelhouse. Um, but when we're thinking about authenticity, Jazz is, is, starts as a black music. It is a black music. Um, and when I say that, I'm not necessarily defining it in terms of particular musical features that are black. I'm not, I'm not kind of making that definition. I'm saying that um, it was created by black people um, and it was largely kind of perpetuated and, and moved through, cult, through black culture. It was important. Um, and it opened a lot of opportunities within black culture. And so around that came a, a kind of a discourse, a way of talking about jazz music um, in terms of authenticity of like, what is real jazz um, and what is not real jazz. And so a lot of what real jazz is came to be defined in terms of blackness. Um, and this is where it gets into the into the really complicated part where again I want to just reiterate because I get this question all the time so it's okay but I am not the one defining what blackness means in jazz what jazz scholars like I have done have kind of gone back through the history and seen okay this is what jazz critics and jazz musicians are saying this is how they're talking about it and in that they're creating these definitions around blackness and so that has to do with um it has to do with swing and it has to do with improvisation like morris mentions um and and this becomes a language where in jazz where it's it's this unique form where where blackness is actually upheld as as truth and as reality and as authenticity and it is used to kind of say like well if you can perform like a black musician and do these kinds of things then you are also an authentic musician and so you get someone like brubeck who he is insisting that he is doing those things there are some people who agree that he's doing those things, but then there are all of these other people who are saying, well, no, you're just too popular. You are, or you are not doing these musical things. And so they've created this kind of musical um, definition based on race, which as we know is not race is though it is a lived experience. It is also a constructed um, experience. And so when we are also talking about musical definitions of race, those are also constructed um, as well. So when we're using race to define authenticity, we're looking through and kind of peeling back layers of, okay, how did that authenticity get um, embedded within race and racial discourse um, in these different time periods? I hope that that... Yeah, um, it, it makes sense. And that, it's just an interesting shift from like what we were talking about a minute ago with um, like the minstrel shows where we wanted, the purpose of it was to have inauthentic experiences. And then by maybe 80 years later or something, you have a shift to, you know, the, the cool or authentic music has to be African-American or black. And that, um, I think that has a lot to do with 
Um, I mean, I don't know what it has to do with, but it seems like your one article um, talked about how um, Davis redid, Miles Davis did a Brubeck song and kind of made it okay for it, like validated Brubeck mm -hmm. by covering his song. And, you know, that's just an interesting shift. And I don't know if it's the, the artists who did it. I think it's the artists who did it and not the society itself, the fans, I guess. I think that one kind of key, when we're moving from talking about black bass minstrelsy to talking about jazz, like one thing to keep in mind is that with black bass minstrelsy, this is um, almost entirely created by white people for white people. And it is, there is this kind of, um, kind of obvious veneer of inauthenticity, but the white people who are viewing it especially for Northern white audiences, blackface minstrelsy was more popular among Northern white audiences than it was around Southern white audiences, in large part because Northern white audiences didn't actually have any experience or very much experience with black people. So for them, it was this kind of authentic representation of blackness. And that's what made it so dangerous, particularly um, leading into the civil war. Um, but so I think with blackface, you have, it's created predominantly by white people for white people. You do have black musicians who are kind of forced to take on the mantle of blackface because um, that's kind of, that's it. If you want to be a performer, that's all there is. Um, but then when we get to jazz with, with jazz music and especially by the 1950s, it's not really, it's not entirely popular music anymore. So it is created by black and white musicians for black and white audiences, but it is seen as, as like this pseudo subversive thing. It's not like, it is not always truly subversive, but there is this, um, there is this non mainstream feel um, that is not the case with Dave Brubeck, but with other artists within jazz. Um, so, and so in, in having that, that language of authenticity around jazz, what they're really kind of doing is setting them apart from, setting themselves apart from mainstream culture. Whereas with blackface, that it was mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good explanation. I think the, um, I don't know if you, um, want to try or we can try to like in the introduction to your book um, the, the various ways in which um, kind of white supremacy and um, filters into music and one of the things that was most interesting to me because I hadn't heard about it was the, um, the this idea of the white audio did you call it or something where the, it has to sound white so like Nat King Cole I think is brought up in by Morris as he was he was allowed to be on the radio because he sounded white enough and then when they put him on TV he was too black to be on TV so what does that mean to sound white artistically I mean I know that there's a more <laughs> thing societally you know but the yeah. music yeah, that's a good question. So um, before we before we started recording, you, you brought up that Amiri Baraka quote. And Amiri Baraka is talking about and kind of comparing um, Charlie Parker with Paul Desmond. Charlie Parker is black, Paul Desmond's white. And um, they're both saxophone players operating in the late 1940s into the 1950s. Um, and what Amiri Baraka is saying is that, well, when you hear Charlie Parker, all the critics call him primitive or raucous. And when you hear um, Paul Desmond, everybody calls him classical or, or pure. They sound, they, that's how they call his sound. And so I think a lot of it has to do with music is, is hard. It's just hard to talk about um, if you don't have a lot of training, if you don't have the analytical stuff 
to do that. And so what you have are a lot of critics who aren't necessarily trained to talk about music writing for audiences who also aren't necessarily trained to, to, to hear an analytical description of music. And so you get adjectives. Adjectives are great. I work with my students um, in 100 level classes to kind of hone how they use adjectives to describe music, but adjectives are particularly susceptible to um, cultural connotation. Um, so when Amiri Baraka is talking about how critics write about the difference between Charlie Parker and Paul Desmond, it's not only that they describe um, Charlie Parker in primitive terms, it's what does primitive mean? Primitive means that Charlie Parker is not intellectual. It means that he hasn't carefully honed his sound to sound that way. Sorry. It means that he hasn't um, thought through things or practiced. And all of that, if you know anything about Charlie Parker, is totally untrue. He um, worked incredibly hard. He practiced. He knew exactly what he was doing um, by that point in the 40s and in the early 50s. And by calling... Paul Desmond, um, pure, by calling his sound pure, um, I mean, that, that's a super racially charged term, especially in the 50s. Um, so that, I mean, that in essence is, is saying, is kind of saying without saying, this is a white saxophonist. Um, the word that I use to, that, that, I, that I kind of go through and, and, and dissect that gets used to describe Dave Brubeck a lot is intellectual. Um, so critics just across the board are calling him, they, they say he has an intellectual sound. Um, and so I, I kind of try to work through, okay, what, what does that mean? Who else is getting called intellectual? Um, and, and it's really within jazz pretty much it, it is used, intellectual is used to describe cool jazz musicians. Cool jazz is a particular subgenre of jazz that is predominantly associated with whiteness. Um, and what I found as I was kind of going through the, the work and how people were talking about Dave Brubeck was that when they're talking about intellectual, they're not just saying it, it sounds like he thought about stuff. They're linking him to Western classical composers. They're linking him to, um, I mean, it's Gershwin and it's Mio, and but also they link him to Beethoven. Bach gets uh, Bach gets mentioned the most out of any composer to compare to Dave Brubeck, and that's not something that gets thrown around nearly as frequently with other black musicians, notably someone like John Lewis of the modern jazz quartet who composes fugues and, uh, and things in a jazz style. That's just not something that happens for, um, for John Lewis in the same manner that it does for Dave Brubeck, who also composes, but isn't doing the kind of strict fugues that John Lewis is doing. So, kind of looking through and, and asking, okay, they've used this word intellectual, how are they using it? Okay, they're also using it with these other composers. Okay, when they use these other composers, they're talking about counterpoint and fugues okay, and, and kind of going through all of these things that these critics are linking. And so by doing that, the critics are, are embedding Dave Brubeck within a sound of whiteness particularly through classical music, um, which at that point is, um, and still is, is seen as predominantly a, a white musical genre. Right, and that, that's, so, I mean, I guess the, the, it's less a actual thing and more an actual, like, critics assigning the, the code to it. So that's, yeah. Right, yeah, there isn't just a, a kind of blank slate white sound necessarily. It's what we have come to understand as a white sound, um, which for the, for the critics was, was classical music at that point. Um, and the, the idea of kind of pure sounds that Amiri Baraka 
um, brings up the end and Morris talks about as well. I think he uses that word too. Um, that is something that kind of stays um, in. And, and I think you can see, if not the word pure, a lot of similarities in, in descriptions that can, can embed musicians within this concept of what a white sound might be. Yeah, and on a kind of on an unrelated note, I'm always hit by the word primitivist because it takes me back to the degenerative art that was, um, you know, the Weimar Republic and how the Nazis came in and kind of deemed mainly um, Jewish and other outsider art, people they didn't like as primitivist and degenerative, and it's quite a loaded term, mm -hmm. I think culturally and historically. So it's not just like, oh, these people sound like primitives. It's also this like dismissive like, mm -hmm. cutoff for at least, I mean, that's how I read it, but I also have <laughs> loaded things in my head too. So that um, music then takes on a whole other set of problems. I mean, we've been talking about jazz and classical and, and I mean, like the Elvis Presleys and the, the Beastie Boys and the M&Ms taking over these forms is even more complicated or differently complicated. How would you kind of? Yeah, I think it's really, it's, uh, it's really interesting and definitely, you're right, definitely complicated. Um, when I think of someone like Eminem, he is someone who by and large has been kind of accepted as like, yeah, you can do this. Um, this, what you do and the way that you do it um, is if we're going to kind of go back to this idea of authentic authenticity, it is authentic. Um, and he has kind of in some ways earned that um, not being a rap and hip hop scholar. Um, I don't know the details quite as well. Other than that, I think he kind of, I, I keep struggling with the word earned, but it seems like he earned it through um, like a, a similar class experience. And so there, there is this kind of other avenue that he took and by and large, it didn't, he has um, helped other black musicians and he has um, been a platform for them in ways that um, other white musicians that, that haven't, haven't really been doing in that genre. Um, so I think of someone else like um, Macklemore, um, sort of more recent, um, who is someone who I think got a lot of criticism for, for not mm -hmm. um, being authentic. Um, and in that, term what what is what they're saying when they're saying that he's not authentic is that this is this is another black musical form rap and hip-hop and that and that is you know fairly clear from again a historical perspective and then through its lineage um that and the fact that it like jazz is based in kind of black experiences and i think a lot of people were looking at macklemore and kind of going okay <laughs> where where are your experiences and, and yeah and how does that how does that play out and and then kind of linking Macklemore to someone like or to a group like the Beastie Boys and also to Dave Brubeck the popularity that you've gotten feels unearned because of that mm -hmm. so you have um you have black musicians who are not getting this coverage and who are not getting uh, this platform. And, and so there's, a, I think that I keep coming back to earned and I hadn't thought of it in this way before, but um, that there is this level of kind of earning that authenticity um, that, that feels entirely unearned if you kind of just come along and are within the genre and then are kind of scooping up awards and recognition and, chart placements um yeah yeah and i mean i yeah i mean it also struck me while, while we were talking about eminem that you know his myth creation happened very quickly like eight mile came out 
and it took what 30 years for the NWA movie to come out. You know, so it's like the you know, he, he was able to, and Vanilla Ice had the same thing. He made a movie right away. So there's like opportunities for, I mean, that's, that's completely, <laughs> completely off topic. But I mean, it's kind of like the white uh, performer got to kind of justify their earning the status. Whereas with the black performers like NWA, they had to kind of, it was assumed that they were authentic and actually gangsters and doing the things that they said. Yeah, I think that there's, when it it comes to that unearned, um, whether it's Dave Brubeck or Vanilla Ice or, or whoever, I think that, and, and yeah, and Eminem falls in this too, that they are for for the, the white audiences um, that, that were kind of driving the market share of, of music. Um, there is a comfort with them and it's because the, and it's because they're white um like there, there's really no use mincing reasons um brubeck you know i i'm sorry to always take it back to him but <laughs> brubeck, was, brubeck was just more comfortable he was featured in ads in vogue and it did housekeeping and woman's home companion they talked about him and they talked about him in ways that, that said, look, jazz used to, this is a quote, jazz used to be the dirty boy or the boy with dirty hands who you wouldn't let come into the house. Um, and now it's, and now it's okay. Like, and so that's, I mean, that's as, you know, <laughs> as a discussion as you can get. Um, and that's, I think that one was, uh, that one was either Women's Home, I think it was Women's Home Companion, but it was in this, this magazine targeting kind of middle-class white women. And suddenly there are middle-class white women who are listening to jazz because of Dave Brubeck. And he, t- he takes a lot of credit for that and says, I, I got them in the door and then they got to go and experience other musicians. I kind of, and, and it creates this respectability aura around jazz. And, you know, Benny Goodman does this a couple decades earlier. Um, Benny Goodman's an all-white uh, swing band in the 1930s. He has Black arrangers who are, who are creating his music. He also has a Black quartet that he performs with in between sets of his orchestra. And, and so he is another one where he is kind of creating this comfort level and this respectability around a genre that was not considered to be respectable so i see that similar similarly happening with um white musicians and with rap and Mm hip-hop that there is a comfort if not a respect if 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 respectability doesn't operate in the same way there's at least a comfort level with them Um, and it's and it's entire it's it's based in race and what white audiences are comfortable with and why they're comfortable with those musicians and then it's also about predominantly white record executives who are who recognize that and and so it's it's about this kind of broader network of the industry it's not just about the musicians it's about the full industry which includes producers and executives and booking agents and audiences as well. And I think that that's, yeah, that's been uh, one of my um, interesting kind of um, things that I've continually uh, returned to because like um, bands like, I'm gonna go way off the field here, but like uh, the uh, John Fogarty uh, Clearance Clearwater Revival, you know, allowed for kind of a folk music to enter into rock, but these are all like suburban or city dwellers from San Francisco. They're not bayou, you know, people playing authentic or what would be called authentic music. So, but the, it was marketable and able to be kind of, you know, and then the people who wanted to explore, the fans could go deeper, but the money was being made up here with, you know, with the yeah with the whatever it is the market you know the package but and that's kind of what my big problem with hamilton has always been you know it allows theater kids to enjoy rap mm-hmm. because they're not going you know that 
it brings rap into a new market, basically, which is good, but at the same time, problematic, right? Right. Yeah, it's it's both. It's it's it is both. Like there, there is some credit to be given to people like Danny Goodman and, and Dave Brubeck for get kind of hooking people and if they are able to then go explore the broader genre beyond the one artist that they came for there is something to be said about that but not everything <laughs> right. <laughs> right like it's, we can't stop there there is room for some critique and some of that deserves to be put on people like Dave Brubeck and on Elvis and on um, these artists, white artists, but it is also, it is to a certain extent beyond them as well. Um, and, and to people whose names we don't know, like we don't know the producers necessarily rap and hip hop changed that a little bit, but we don't necessarily know the producers. We don't necessarily know the record companies involved. Um, but when we have a musician, we have that face that we know very well. Um, so yeah, it's, there's a, there's a lot of room for critiquing and, and there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of people to place that critique on, but yeah. I, and there, we could go on and on, but I think this is probably a good place to stop unless you had any other points you wanted to make direly. Um, I think one thing did come to my brain as we were talking about respectability and I, and I did just want to draw that tie into the Morris article talking about Motown and black respectability. And I think that's a place where black respectability is again, another one of those things that is um, uh, sometimes contentious to think about, but it does get kind of mobilized and operationalized in really um, important ways like with Motown to get black musicians um, a, a, a place. Duke Ellington is another person that would be in a similar boat sometimes, not all the time, but that that kind of operates in that kind of realm of respectability. And so it is a thing where a lot of people kind of critique black respectability politics, but there is kind of a political subversive thing that's happening even in that, um, that I think deserves to get some recognition. And there's a, a, a scholar who's worked on that that's, um, uh, Evelyn Higginsbotham um, that has worked through that and I just wanted to shout that out since yeah. I raised respectability in a white context I just wanted to yeah. right. 